Madam Secretary, on behalf of just everybody here, I'd really like to welcome you, welcome you back to the University of Denver. Um, and to, of course, Denver weather, you know, if it's, <laughs> if it's not sunny, it's about to snow. And so, uh, anyway, great to see you. Uh, we have just an, an amazing audience here. Chancellor Coombe is right here in, in the front, and there are many other people. So uh, I thought maybe we would talk a little for 20, 30 minutes. And then I've got a stack of questions <laughs> from the, I, in fact, let me get it out of my pocket. It's really weighing me down here. And then maybe I thought we, we could kind of go to a more interactive format where I'll give you some of these questions. Great. And I won't make up too many of them. <laughs> but, I don't so. know, Chris. <laughs> great. So anyway, great to have you here. And uh, you've been out of government now uh, three and a half years. So let me ask you, uh, what's it like? Great. Well, first of all, let me thank you for welcoming me back home to the University of Denver and Chancellor Coombe. Thank you very much for welcoming me here. The, uh, you, the campus has changed a lot, you know, since, uh, <laughs> since I was here, but uh, I won't take it personally that uh, I had to skate in a barn, and now I look at that <laughs> arena and it's, it's wonderful. So you've done a wonderful job, Chancellor, and uh, to all of you who've supported the university, I just want to thank you for, for doing so. There's no more important uh, task, no more important responsibility than supporting institutions of higher education and uh, the education of our young people. So thanks very much. Uh, now as to the, the question, well, I'll tell you the most important difference in being in and out of government. Uh, the most important difference is I get up in the morning, I get my coffee, I read the newspaper, and I think, isn't that interesting? <laughs> and uh, I go right on to whatever else I want to do because I no longer have responsibility for what's in it. But uh, it has been really great being um, out of government. I had a wonderful eight-year run, a uh, large part of it, Chris, you were a part of that, and uh, we got to take on extraordinary challenges, some of them really in uncharted territory. Uh, but at the end of eight years, I very well knew where I was going, and I was going back to Stanford University to be a university professor, because that is really what I am in, in essence. And so I now spend my days with um, undergraduates and graduate students in Graduate School of Business, uh, helping them to discover uh, what their passion is, just as uh, Professor uh, Dr. Joseph Corbell did for me when I was a student here at the University of Denver, a, a wayward and lost music major who had decided that she was going to end up teaching 13-year-olds uh, to murder Beethoven or maybe playing at Nordstrom and decided to find another career and uh, fortunately wandered into a course in international politics taught by uh, Dr. Corbell and he opened up this world of the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe and diplomacy and that's how I ended up where I am today and so I believe strongly that uh, professors can have a huge uh, impact and so I'm happy to be back in the university. Okay. Well, so you were in the, uh, in the administration for eight years, and you basically split it between two jobs. You had the uh, National Security Advisor job for four years, and you had Secretary of State. So which is a better job? <laughs> well, they're certainly different. Um, and George Schultz, my, my predecessor a couple of times removed, and my great friend, once told me that Secretary of State's the best job in government. And I think he's right, because you get to represent this great country, you get to go out as the chief diplomat. Uh, it is line authority. You have responsibility for America's diplomacy, for America's diplomats. You run an agency of 57,000 people worldwide, and I actually like the management side of it. Um, I was once a provost of a university, and uh, being Secretary of State is kind of a little bit like being a pro. Well, you like that job? I actually uh, like that uh, okay. job. I actually like that job. And I liked, uh, I liked the job as uh, secretary and all the management side of that. So um, I would have to say that uh, being secretary of state was really the pinnacle of um, a career for someone who cared about international right. affairs. I loved being national security advisor. Don't get me wrong. It's a great job. You really are staffed to the president, but in the final analysis, you're staffed to the president. And you spend your time making certain that the president can act in a particular way. As Secretary of State, you really are acting on behalf of the United States. I told President Bush once that being National Security Advisor was a little bit like doing 
foreign policy by remote control. So it's, can I get Secretary A to do this and Secretary B to do that? You don't own uh, any assets, really, as National Security Advisor. You don't have the diplomats. You don't own a budget. You aren't responsible to the Congress as a constituted officer. And so it's a great job, but it's a job with a lot of responsibility and almost no authority. Your authority comes really only from the president. As Secretary of State, you hold your own authority, and uh, I really enjoyed it. And I like the diplomacy. I like doing the diplomacy. Not to speak of the people you got to work with. Oh, not with, to right? speak of the spectacular <laughs> assistant secretaries that you sometimes run across. Uh, who? Uh, <laughs> but but let me say a word about that because, um, as in any enterprise, the people that you work with uh, and the people who are a part of your team are absolutely critical to getting anything done, but they're also uh, very critical to making the job tolerable and sometimes even fun. And um, I was fortunate to work with great people in both cases, but in state in particular, I was fortunate to have a set of assistant secretaries, Chris of course was the secretary for East Asia, uh, who I tried to invest a lot of authority in them to really be the face of and the voice of and the authority for the U.S. government in their area of responsibility. You cannot, as Secretary of State, be everywhere all the time. And it has to be when the Assistant Secretary for East Asia walks in that the highest ranking officers, the highest ranking people in that country uh, are going to realize that they're speaking on behalf of the United States, on behalf of the President. And so I, it's often important to have I really good uh, people. All of us felt that way. All of us felt that way who worked for you at that, that level. We really felt very much empowered. And I, I think for those of us dealing with, sometimes with controversial issues, you need the backing. I mean, you need to make sure that someone's got your back. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can speak for all of the assistant secretaries who felt very much that way. But let me tell you, take you back maybe to the beginning of the administration in January 2001. Now, you probably had some plans that you saw in the next four years, we're going to do X, Y, and Z. I know you're looking at NATO enlargement. Uh, I know you're looking at e issues like missile defense. Um, so when you're in these jobs, do, do best laid plans always, uh, what happens? Well, best laid plans go right out the window. Um, I, one of the, I'll just give you one example because it's so vivid, still to this day in my mind. So President Bush was, of course, the governor of Texas. He had a great interest in Mexico and Latin America as a result. And in fact, before he was inaugurated, but after he was elected, um, before they were inaugurated and before they, uh, but uh, after they were elected. Vicente Fox, now the new president of Mexico, and George W. Bush met in Dallas, Texas to lay out an agenda for U.S.-Mexican relations because they believed, and I think they were right, that putting that relationship on firm footing was critical to a democratic and prosperous West, Western Hemisphere. A lot could be done. And so our first, uh, the trip, as you know, the president gets to sort of choose where he makes his first trip, and that's going to be very symbolic of what he really cares about. So the first trip that he made was to Mexico to meet with Vicente Fox at Vicente Fox's ranch in uh, San Cristobal, Mexico. So he goes to the ranch, and we're reveling in U.S.-Mexican relations. It's February of 2001. And I'm sitting at the table on this beautiful veranda, President Bush, Colin Powell, me, Karen Hughes, um, and we're sitting there. And all of a sudden, I look in the corner, and Ari Fleischer, who's the press secretary, is motioning for me to come over. I'm thinking, I'm sitting next to the President of the United States. Leave me alone, leave me alone. <laughs> and uh, you know, now he's motioning, and he's getting ever more agitated. So finally, I got up, and I walked over, and he says, why are we bombing Baghdad? I said, what? He says, why are we bombing Baghdad? He said, the press, all of their blackberries are going off, and it says we're bombing Baghdad. <laughs> so I call Colin, who gets up and walks back, and we're chatting, and pretty soon we call Karen Hughes, because she's the communications director, and the president's sitting there. And pretty soon it's like survivor, you know, everybody's left the <laughs> island but the president. And he's sitting there, slightly annoyed, and uh, it turns out, we were flying something called no-fly zones as a part of the sanctions against Saddam Hussein coming out of the 1991 war. 
the U.S. Air Force would three, four times a week fly no-fly zones to keep Saddam's Air Force on the ground. Well, this particular routine mission uh, turned out not to be so routine. We got, as the Pentagon explained it, a little close to the uh, air raid warnings in Baghdad, and it set off and the place lit up and it looked like we were bombing Baghdad. Of course we weren't. Well, as you imagine, at the press conference, every effort that we're making to show how incredibly important U.S.-Mexican relations are, how great Vicente Fox are, why are you bombing Baghdad? Did you tell President Fox you were going to war in Iraq? Total disaster. Best laid plans. Yeah. And I can go through many instances of that kind. And then, of course, 9-11. And everybody's agenda is fundamentally remade by the fact that uh, we, the most powerful military and economic power of the, the 20th and 21st century, have been attacked by a stateless group of terrorists operating out of a failed state called, called Afghanistan. They've taken down the Twin Towers, blown a hole in the Pentagon, and it's cost maybe $300,000. And all of a sudden, the agenda is fundamentally different. And so from there, I mean, it was really, I think it was fundamentally different for probably the remaining seven yes. and a half years. Yes. It's fundamentally yeah. different because from September 11th, every day after is September 12th. Every day after is don't let it happen again. Yeah. Um, and in the first months immediately after September 11th, everybody was certain yeah. that it was going to happen again. Yeah. Um, you, it was like going into a dark room and there were 12 different doors and something might yeah. spring out of any door. Um, I was explaining to one of the classes that I uh, addressed today that the intelligence agencies, having missed the 9-11 attack, were suddenly just dumping every possible threat on the desk of the President of the United States. The terrorist threat matrix suddenly looked like a phone book. And so every day you're getting up and you think something's about so to So all the sensors are turned up really high. The sensors are really high and, and frankly there's a little bit of, you know, well, we're not going to be wrong again. Yeah. And so even if somebody phones in that he's about to blow up the Sears Tower, uh, and it has no credibility, it's still in the threat matrix. And so from then, uh, for a period of time, until the capture of uh, first Abu Zubaydah and then Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, which takes place over about a period of about a year, when we really now have under lock and key Al-Qaeda's field generals, and we begin to learn what they're plotting and planning, we learn the structure of Al-Qaeda, now we feel not so much on the defensive, and you can begin to turn to other things, like what are the long-term implications mm -hmm. of the, the terrorism attacks? Well, the freedom agenda, the absence of freedom. But in those first few months, it's just about preventing the next attack. Mm -hmm. Now, we've read in your, in your memoirs, we've read in a number of memoirs about your concern about Guantanamo, that it was seen as something that had to be done because we were really, you know, dealing with a threat that we didn't quite understand the dimensions of it. We didn't quite know how to manage this, this issue. And so this Guantanamo set up, the new administration comes in and says, we're going to get rid of that thing. It's still there. Right. So, but I know you had a lot of concerns about it at the time. At the time, when we set up Guantanamo, we had a very practical problem. We were picking up terrorists in large numbers on the battlefield. And we had nowhere to put them, because you didn't want to leave them in Afghanistan at this particular point, when Afghanistan was still uh, quite chaotic. You most certainly want, were not going to bring them to the continental United States. Um, and so Guantanamo, uh, which is, of course, US territory uh, in Cuba, essentially, yeah. became a place that we would hold them. And um, until they were either no longer dangerous or no longer of intelligence value. But as time went on, uh, you didn't want to be, I remember Don Rumsfeld said, you know, I don't want to be the world's jailer. So over the long period of time, you'd like to be able to get these people out, get them tried, and so forth. And so some significant number of them were either sent back to their home countries, if we could get home countries to take them who would track them and make sure they weren't getting back in the terrorism build business, 
We couldn't send some to countries where they had very bad human rights records and we were, couldn't attest to what might happen that to would them. would be Uyghurs in China. Like the Uyghurs in China. And we used to say Uyghurs can't be choosers, but... Uh... <laughs> Actually, they were very choosy, if you yes. remember, about yes. where they wanted to be. But so the Uyghurs, uh, Uyghurs were a good example of this, so we couldn't send some back. And then some were just flat out too dangerous to go anywhere. They would say things like, let me out of here and I'll find as many Americans as I can and kill them. Yeah. Well, what's the president yeah. to do? So uh, to this day, uh, there are people that we can't get out of Guantanamo, mm -hmm. even though we wanted to start the process of closing Guantanamo yeah. ourselves. Yeah. So basically, I mean, you're looking at an era that became in and of itself very transformational. I mean, the, the notion of uh, the greatest threat to the world now coming from essentially an, an NGO, which is what Al-Qaeda Al was. So the whole question was, what is statecraft in a transitional period when in fact half the actors out there have nothing yeah, to do with right, states. Right. Well, yes, and uh, the stateless group of terrorists, and by the way, the other aspect of this, as I said, operating in really ungoverned spaces. So all of a sudden you realize that you've got kind of two problems. One is to mobilize states uh, to deal with these non-state actors who are transnational. They move it pretty easily across borders. Uh, how do you track them? How do you track their finances? It turns out nobody was particularly good at tracking yeah. terrorist finances. But terrorists, when you can track terrorist finances, it's not just that you can stop them from getting the money, but you mm -hmm. can also track them through mm -hmm. their finances. So we worked with the international community to try to do that sort of thing. But it was also, you suddenly had a high stake in what happened in failed states. Right because their territory was so easily used by terrorists, drug runners, uh, uh, arms runners, human traffickers. Yeah. Uh, my colleague at Stanford, a man named Steve Krasner, who worked for me in the State yeah. Department, also has written a series of articles about what he calls responsible uh, sovereigns. That is, states that can actually govern their territory, govern their borders, keep this kind of activity from going on. And there are an awful lot of places mm -hmm. where nobody has authority. If you think about Somalia, nobody has authority. If you think about the territory between Pakistan and Afghanistan, mm -hmm. nobody has authority. If you think about the area between the US uh, border on the south and the Mexican northern border, there are places that are basically mm -hmm. ungoverned where mm -hmm. the cartels rule. Yeah. And so you suddenly had two different kinds of problems of statecraft that we've not faced. Mm -hmm. How to unify the international system to deal with transnational actors and how to deal with these ungoverned right. or failing states. Yeah. One of the issues, of course, has been the use of drone strikes. Now, that predated the Bush administration. Yes. I mean, that was going on in Afghanistan, mm -hmm. for example. Uh, but I think what happened is the marrying up with some very special technology that enabled those drone strikes to be quite accurate, quite lethal. Yes. And that also didn't end with the uh, Bush administration. No, that it's, is, accelerated. That is, it's accelerated under the Obama It's accelerated. Yes. So anyway, if you could comment on that, because I think it is part and parcel of this kind of uh, difficulty of determining what does an international border mean to us when it doesn't mean much to bad guys. Yes, uh, you, you know the stories or the, the technology that Chris is referring to. So you have these drones. Uh, they are remotely piloted, let's just leave it at that, yeah. and they are able to gather uh, information on where a target is and then deliver a blow to it. So this is really quite dramatic. And they're able to do it uh, in territory, therefore, of states with which we are not at war. So in Yemen or in the northwest frontier of Pakistan. And so all of a sudden you can use this lethal um, technology against targets in places that you're not actually at war. Sometimes they are even allies as they are in Pakistan. And this raises all kinds of questions about sovereignty, all kinds of questions about do you notify the ones who, where you're doing this. Uh, it raises all kinds of headaches for diplomats because of course, you've got on the ground, you've got the ambassador, you've got uh, the uh, intelligence people, and then you've got the military. 
and who gets to make the call as to whether or not going after that target uh, is going to destroy the relationship uh, as it's tended to really undermine our relationships in Pakistan. It's also raising some very serious issues about uh, due process. So uh, the death of the uh, American citizen who was an al-Qaeda propagandist uh, in, Yemen. in Yemen, um, how do we, what do we think about that? Mm -hmm. um, that he was clearly uh, an al-Qaeda propagandist. I guess you could say if we'd had a chance to go after Goebbels in this way, in uh, yeah. the Nazi regime, would we have gone after him? Probably. But he wasn't actually operating as such. Yeah. Uh, so it raises a whole new set of issues. And while we might be comfortable that our democratic institutions will check one another, the president will ultimately be checked by the Congress and maybe by the press and maybe by the American Civil Liberties Union, and then you'll have the courts getting involved at some point. What about countries in which you don't have those checks and balances? How are we going to feel when the Chinese decide to use drone technology in Tibet? Uh, so this raises a whole set of new issues uh, that I, we've not really, the laws haven't quite caught up with the technology. So where do you come out on that? Well, I don't have to anymore, fortunately. Uh, <laughs> I can be an academic on this, you know, yeah. on the one hand, on the other hand. Uh, I can Here's another that. hand if right. you need it. <laughs> That's right. Um, look, I come out that the international legal, people who are interested in international law should be paying some attention to this problem. One of the problems that we had immediately after September 11th was we had to put in place a whole bunch of measures and the, there was no kind of international legal framework for them. We used what was there. We sort of used uh, international law as it was understood and mm -hmm. treaties that were in place, but they were ill-fitting for what was actually happening. When it is really hard when technologies and practices are emerging for international law to catch up because the international legal profession you know, they, they have to get together, they have to meet a thousand times, they have to write a lot of laws, et cetera, they have to write papers, and then they have to disagree, and they have to write more papers. We don't have time. Mm -hmm. So some group, and I would hope they would actually be international lawyers outside mm -hmm. of the government, should be really addressing these issues. Uh, there are a couple of projects around the country on national security and international law. Mm -hmm. But uh, this is an area where we really need a lot, of, a lot mm -hmm. of good thought. And it's a place where academic institutions could make a real, um, a, a real contribution. Yeah. Now, when you look out, out of the world there, in addition to saying, not my problem anymore, <laughs> but I mean, uh, we've, we've learned recently of this idea of a pivot, that is, away from the Middle East uh, toward Asia, toward East Asia, which is perceived as being neglected. Now, I'm a little sensitive about this accusation, what with having made about 800 trips there during my four years. But in addition to a, being a pivot away from wars that are winding down, it's viewed in Europe as kind of a pivot again, away from the Atlantic yeah. Yeah. relationship. Well, first of all, Asia is important and has been important. Not only did you make a bunch of trips there, but so did I. You know, we spent a lot of time on the North Korean nuclear program. Yeah. We I distinctly good, meet, yeah, remember I, meeting you uh, there yeah, a few right. times. Yeah. We had a pretty good, yeah. pretty interesting yeah. policies about yeah. China. And by the way, we had a we built a new strategic relationship with India, yeah. which some think of as South Asia, but is actually very important to Asia more broadly. So, mm -hmm. you know, there was a lot going on. But but uh, even if you wanted to say you wanted a pivot or a tilt toward Asia. I sometimes worry that actually what we're getting is let's pivot toward a place that's actually not that hard because the Middle East is really messy. All oh, right. Yeah. Um, Asia's, why is Asia not that hard? I don't mean it's not hard. Of course it's hard. There are a lot of difficult relationships there. There are the problems of the decline of Japan. We all want to see Japan on the rise again because Japan is a stable democracy, big economy, and our friend. Uh, South Korea is a vibrant democracy, growing democracy. 
growing economy, but you know, it's got this nasty neighbor on what, the what other side, you know, the, the ones where you actually went there, um, <laughs> unbelievably. Um, and then you've got, uh, you know, you've got complicated relationships between China and Southeast Asia. So I don't mean to suggest it's not hard, but you know, you've got a lot of assets in yeah. Asia. You have strong democratic allies. You have a strong military presence. Uh, we dominate the Pacific militarily. Mm -hmm. uh, we have powerful economic relationships there. There are even growing institutions that matter there, like the Asia Pacific Economic yeah. Council. Or the ASEAN Regional Forum. Or the ASEAN Regional Forum. Do you remember Forum. we sat in the ASEAN Regional Forum, I believe it was Singapore, and we were looking at the North Korean envoy, yes. who tragically died about uh, two months later, but we thought he had died at the meeting. <laughs> And I said, no, no, I think he's asleep. And you said, I'm not so sure. Uh, look at his mouth. And so we had this discussion. I think uh, we had uh, uh, the, Thai, the Thai foreign minister was talking at the time. But uh, yeah, You can tell that at the Asia Regional Forum, clearly you did other things other than just listen to what was going on. They could be pretty boring. But... but uh, <laughs> But you did, you did have all of these institutions, and you've got allies. You know, the Middle East has come unstuck. Almost every pillar of stability that we thought was there in the Middle East, Egypt, the way we thought about Turkey, uh, the relationship, but we sort of thought we understood how to fix the Israeli-Palestinian problem, even if we couldn't quite do it. Um, all of it's kind of come unstuck. And we need to be sure that we don't pivot toward Asia and leave that uninstitutionalized mess in the Middle East. Because if we don't focus, and I think this is a bit what makes the Europeans uh, uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, we and the Europeans have a lot of work to do to lay a foundation in the Middle East so that it doesn't blow up repeatedly down the road. And even if we were able to achieve energy independence from the Middle East. Mm -hmm. It will come back to haunt us at some point if it isn't structured in the right way. The Middle East is in particular right now vulnerable to a rise of sectarian proxy war between powerful Sunni states and the Iranians. Uh, one way to understand what is going on in Syria is that you have, as you do throughout the Middle East, lines that were drawn by the British, basically on the back of an envelope, mm -hmm. that obliterated any lines between Sunnis and Shia. So all over the Middle East, you have Sunni-dominated uh, Sunni governments suppressing sometimes Shia majorities, mm -hmm. as, as you do, for instance, in Bahrain, where you have a Sunni monarch mm -hmm. and a 70% Shia population. Yeah. You had in Iraq Saddam Hussein 20% Sunni population, 65% yeah. Shia population. It's flipped under one man, one vote. And now there's a lot of nervousness among the Sunni population as to whether the Shia are going to do the same thing to them that they did to, to the, the Shia. Shia. Yeah. So you've got these confessional tensions growing. And unless the United States and Europe, which have some sense of what kinds of institutions might prevent the outright secular, uh, sectarianism from mm -hmm. exploding in the Middle East, we're going to have a really bad situation there five, ten years down the road. Yeah. And so even if we pivot, quote unquote, toward Asia, I hope it's not because we think this Middle East thing is kind of too messy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, what is your sense? Because we did jump into to Libya. I mean, when you look carefully at who is flying those sorties, it was not the Belgian Air Force. So. Um, <laughs> Right. So what is your sense? I mean, we kind of handled it there. But, but Libya, I, I, look, I, I don't, again, I am overstating it when I say it's easy. Right? Mm -hmm. But Libya was easier. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody liked Muammar Gaddafi. Nobody. Uh, more, but he liked you, I uh, well, yeah. <laughs> I knew about, about, about halfway through starting that sentence, I thought, this is going to make me the straight man for that lie. <laughs> but that quite apart. Um, 
and I'll tell you the story if you'd like. Would you like the story? We'd love to hear All it. Right. How about okay. it? All right. <laughs> so the reason that I went to Libya is uh, that the Gaddafi had given up his weapons of mass destruction. And so we had verifiably destroyed his most, um, most important weapons of mass destruction. And the kind of quid pro quo was we would normalize relations and the Secretary of State would go there. There had not been an American Secretary of State in Libya since 1954. Mm -hmm. So um, as I was preparing to go, we first had to get Gaddafi to uh, compensate the victims of uh, Pan Am 102, which he did. And now I'm going off to Libya. Well, as I was getting ready to go, we were getting, I was getting reports from fellow foreign minister colleagues and from some of our diplomats that he had a crush on me. <laughs> and uh, so I'm thinking, okay, this is going to be a little weird. And then, um, <laughs> and then we started getting um, the planning done, and they were saying, well, he'd like to meet you in his tent. I said, uh, <laughs> you know, I don't know what that means, but it doesn't sound good. I don't think so. And so mm -hmm. we said, no, it'll be. So I go to Libya. It's a kind of normal diplomatic encounter in a lot of ways, as normal as it can be with Gaddafi. Um, but we're talking about Sudan, and we're talking about uh, Africa, and we're talking about supply routes for Darfur through Libya. And we get through the, uh, the event, and, and we're having dinner, and he says, I have a video that I had made for you. And I thought, oh no, what is this? <laughs> well, it was this quite innocent little video of me with Vladimir Putin and me with Hu Jintao and me with, you know, Ariel Sharon, all set to the music that he had had written for me, Black Flower in the White House. <laughs> and so that was oh. the, and oh. I thought, this is really weird, get on the plane for Algeria as soon as possible. <laughs> <laughs> and so I did. Um, I did exactly that. But now back to Libya okay. and her. <laughs> So we... Um, I'm glad you asked, though. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so we... Why were we able to do Libya? Well, we did this under a doctrine called the responsibility to protect. Uh, Qaddafi was threatening his people, so the UN has this doctrine, the responsibility to protect. So we weren't going to let him mow down his own people. We weren't going to let him massacre his own people. Fine. But he basically had no military of any consequence, and he had no friends. And so we were able to put together with the Arab League, which really detest him, uh, detested him, a way to basically defeat his army and let the rebels then drive him out of power and let events take their course in Libya. Fast forward to Syria. Syria's hard. Uh, not only does Assad have a real military, uh, but the Arab League, which would like to get rid of him, uh, in part because he is an Alawite, which is a minority sect of uh, Shia, and so you have the Sunni states again sort of pressing. But he's got big friends in Iran, big friends in Russia, and uh, the Chinese who don't want to even hint that, in, that interference in, quote, the internal affairs of a country is acceptable. And so now it's a lot more complicated. And now all of a sudden the responsibility to protect isn't so yeah. dominant in our thinking. And so I think Syria fits into the hard category. And what I'm saying is I really hope that we're not trying, we're not starting to walk away from things in the Middle East because they're hard. Mm -hmm. Because if we and the Europeans are not the ones who are doing the sort of strategic design for where we want to go, you're likely to give way to kind of proxy war mm -hmm. between the Iranians on the one side and the Sunni states mm -hmm. on the other. Okay. I think we're going to go to questions shortly, but I do want to ask you about Iraq and Afghanistan. We've pulled the troops out of Iraq. It's politics there, it's not a lot of fun to watch, but it's not much fun to watch it here either. So, uh, um, and then in Afghanistan, I think it's a really tougher situation. Yeah. But how, how do you see these two situations? Yeah. Uh, well, you were ambassador to Iraq, um, and you, you dealt with the Iraqis every day. And 
Like I have, I actually really like the Iraqis because they're sort of irascible and they're tough and probably they're one of the few peoples that would have made it through what they made it through. But they actually have institutions that given time might work to overcome this Sunni-Shia divide that we're worried about. Now there's a lot of suspicion of Maliki because he is a Shia, but he's an Arab Shia. He's not a Persian Shia. He couldn't stand the Iranians, which is why he spent his exile in Syria. So I think that if you, if given time, the Iraqis might learn to make these institutions work. Mm -hmm. They have a couple of things going for them. They have pretty good security forces that we help to train, and they've got a lot of money. And uh, that might give them a chance. Now, they pulled off this uh, Arab uh, League summit. Uh, it, ironically, the Gulf states, the Gulf Arabs didn't go because they want to send a message that they yeah. don't want him leaning too close to the Iranians. But it's devolved into sort of normal Arab politics with mm -hmm. the uh, Iraqis. I would have preferred to have a residual force there. Yeah. But we will have strong ties to the Iraqis. They're likely to be the fourth largest purchaser of American military equipment. We will train them on that military equipment. Uh, we can use things like the International Military Exchange Program to train Iraqis. I think we'll do okay. It'll be, you'll have spectacular events because the terrorists are able to pull off a suicide bombing here and there. But basically, I think it's moving in the right direction. Afghanistan is much harder. It was always going to be harder. It's the fifth poorest country in the world. Um, I was saying to some of the students today, when I first flew over Afghanistan for the first time, I thought to myself, these people have been bequeathed high mountains and rocks, all right, mm -hmm. and dirt. It's a really poor, tough place, very tribal um, and violent. But we've got, if we don't lose our nerve and if we are all in until 2014, which is the NATO deadline, I think we can achieve three things. And they're pretty, for me now, minimalist goals. Number one, train the security forces so that the Taliban is not an existential threat to the Afghan government. Right. Not an existential threat, means can't march on Kabul and overthrow the government. Secondly, help the Afghans in the provinces to get some decent governance in place and to affirm the Afghan constitution, which enshrines things like women's rights. And third and the hardest is try to work for some stable relationship between Afghanistan and Pakistan, because as long as that border is uh, the free reign for terrorists going back and forth, it's going to ha be hard to have either a stable Afghanistan or a Pakistan. Yeah. But if we stop spending so much time talking about how quickly we're going to get out mm -hmm. and spend the next two years doing that, yeah. I think we will actually leave in Afghanistan. Yeah, really focus on focus what on we need what to we do. We need to do, do it, uh, stop sending signals to the contrary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because one of the real dangers is the just chatter out mm -hmm. there in the White House, in the Pentagon about, mm -hmm. well, we might leave earlier and so forth, because that emboldens mm -hmm. the Taliban to mark their little calendars day by day until we leave. Yeah. Just one other question, but this is in your role as Secretary of State, although it goes to your, your previous role, National Security Advisor, and that is a sort of overarching issue like climate change. And climate change is, uh, well, I think we've solved it here in Denver today, but uh, <laughs> climate change is an issue where there's a lot of diplomacy to it. There's a lot of posturing to it in, in the diplomacy, and sometimes it you know, doesn't make you feel that right. good at right. the end of the day. But you described a rather uh, extraordinary scene in your, in your book of having had our policy changed when you weren't quite aware yeah. that our policy was being being changed and essentially replacing something with nothing. Right, right. This was, um, we were not too long in office and um, the Kyoto Protocol, which frankly was a disastrous idea um, and it, it had gone down in a, a straw vote in the United States Senate 99 to nothing. There are not many things that you can get a 99 to nothing vote on. So there was never any thought that 
the Bush administration, when we came into office, was going to support the Kyoto Protocol. In fact, we had said in the election campaign that we would not. But President Bush had talked about greenhouse gases and uh, worrying about pollutants and so forth. And so the, con the, the Republican uh, caucus had asked the president to clarify his position, this is in February of 2001, clarify his position on what constitutes a pollutant, because some were worried that he was about to declare uh, uh, on electrical plants and so forth. It, so it was mostly a domestic policy issue. So a letter was written to go to the Republican um, leadership, and uh, the letter said the Kyoto Protocol would not be followed. When I read it, um, I thought to myself, well, you know, in diplomatic language you say, we're not going to do this. However, we will work with you toward yeah. a solution that is mutually beneficial, agreeable, <laughs> and that we all love somewhere down yeah. the road. Yeah. And it's kind of throwaway language yeah. to make pe people feel that the do door hasn't been completely shut. Yeah. So I walked down to the Oval Office and I said, you know, Mr. President, we need to add this line because the well, the letter was already gone. The vice president had taken it to the Congress. And the president was quite taken aback, and he said, but it's too late. I called Colin Powell, and I called um, uh, Christy Whitman, who was EPA, and we knew it was about to be a big explosion, uh, but it was too late. Um, the president was really, and I said to him, I said, this is going to now um, put a pall over your foreign policy. This is sort of your first foreign policy act, and this isn't good. And as it turns out, even though I think we did many, many things to uh, deal with the climate change issue, with uh, global warming, um, we never quite got out of that box from yeah. that first moment. And frankly, I add it to the problem because, um, you know, I was new in the job, and the next day I went to uh, the Swedish ambassador's house for lunch. And you know how the Europeans could be. They all came at me like gangbusters about this letter, which then made me react. And so I said, Kyoto's dead on arrival, which of course took about five seconds to make its way around European capitals into newspapers and so forth. It was an off the record conversation. And um, you know, so I admit to adding to the problem myself, but it just shows how the first thing that you do can color very much how people see, right. and you never quite then gain the upper hand. It's the old first impression. First issue. impression. Okay. All right, well, I think we'll go to some questions. All right, we've already done the Qaddafi thing. Uh, <laughs> all right, first question. With your transition from Secretary of State to your post at Stanford, what do you think about the role of track two diplomacy? In fact, we haven't discussed that at all. I think track two diplomacy has a, has a place, and, and for those of you who don't live in our world um, daily, track two diplomacy essentially uh, a very sticky foreign policy problem, and you get together people who are no longer, who are not actually in government at that moment, maybe they're former uh, government officials, maybe they are uh, from academic institutions, and the theory is that they have the freedom to work more uh, creatively on some of these problems and then hopefully to feed that creativity back into the governmental process. And I think there is certainly a place for it. Um, I think we've had some pretty good track two diplomacy on the North Korean issue, for instance. I think we've had some pretty good track two diplomacy on uh, the Middle East. Uh, but the track two diplomacy should never get crosswise with what the government is trying to do. I always very much valued the fact that uh, people engaged in track two diplomacy, most of whom I knew, always took the, the uh, chance to call and say, here's what we're doing, is there anything you really don't want us to do? Because the danger is that on the other side of the table, particularly where you have your, your partner as an authoritarian regime, mm -hmm. uh, they really are still representing the positions of their government and you can get a disconnect on the American side, but not on the, yeah, not track, on the other side. Track two on the North Korean side is yeah. really not quite not the same. Not really quite track yeah. two, that's right, exactly. Okay, well this is a question about your view of China's role in the world in the coming decades, and I think you're in a great position to answer because you just uh, visited our Pardee Center. Yes, which by the way is a remarkable 
which kind of laid out these variables yes, and right, saw how right, it went right. forward. So how do you see this? I mean, is, is China going to become the new Soviet Union? Uh, yeah. well, you know, what's... Yeah. Well, we haven't done very well in international politics with rising powers, right? Yeah. Um, Germany, Japan, you name it, we've not done very well. The one rising power that was easily accommodated was the United States, but we were a continent away and divided by great oceans. Uh, and so really the question is, how do you accommodate a rising uh, China, and what are the challenges to that? And given that China is going to be influential, how do you channel that in new influential China in positive ways rather than in negative ways? And what are your chances of doing that? And I think our chances of doing that are still pretty good. Um, and I think they're pretty good for a couple of reasons. Uh, first of all, because even though China is dramatically changing and uh, rising, mm -hmm it still has a lot of work to do domestically and it knows it. Um, I was in China in 1988 for the first time. The streets of Beijing were competition between a few horse carts, a few automobiles, and a whole lot of bicycles. Well, that's not China anymore. Uh, they've lifted maybe 500 million people out of poverty, but they got several hundred million more to go. Uh, it's a country that's experiencing a lot of stresses and strains in terms of uh, labor. Uh, issues in terms of product safety issues. Uh, it's experiencing stresses and strains, 186,000 uh, reported riots last year. Um, and it's got a pretty rigid political system that is itself under a lot of strain, and they know it. They know they're riding a tiger. Just look at how terrified they are of the internet, mm -hmm. uh, where they're looking for the last human rights advocate out in Shenzhen province who might be causing trouble. So. It's a country that's got a lot of domestic issues yeah. still. And so uh, while it will begin to have more of an international profile, um, I don't think it is yet in the category of a great power that wishes to imprint its uh, values and its interest on the international system. And so to me, we've got time to channel um, a lot of what is going on in China in positive directions. Um, I've been, now but we have to be pretty hard-nosed about it, mm -hmm. I was an advocate of the accession of China to the WTO because we all believe that a, an enlarged China's economy untethered mm -hmm. would be a problem. Yeah. China has not been as attentive to many of the rules of the WTO as it should be, and mm -hmm. we ought to be pressuring them on that, on the currency and so forth. Right. Secondly, uh, we ought to be certain that we can check whatever Chinese military adventurism there might be in the Asia Pacific region. But I'm pretty confident yeah. that unless we do something really stupid, the Chinese are not going to be a military competitor for the United States in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, and probably in the lifetime of the young people who are studying here. Mm -hmm. Uh, American, the preponderance of military power for the United States in the Pacific outstrips anything in human history when you mm -hmm. look at the, the relative weight. Now, we do have to keep technologically up. We have to be careful that we don't fall into the trap of that means an ever bigger Navy and military budget because the Chinese are probably not going to challenge us symmetrically. They'll challenge us in space, as they did with the ASAT test in 2007. They will challenge us in cyber, where they are quite good. Mm -hmm. So we have to keep our technology ahead, but the idea that we have to challenge, they're going to challenge us militarily in the Pacific, I think, yeah. is misplaced. The final point I'd, I'd make is the only way China surpasses the United States for economic and therefore political um, predominance in the international system is if we do something, uh, if, if the United States does not deal with its own internal problems yeah. and cedes the battlefield, if you will, to some other state. And that means, you know, we can't keep borrowing money that we can't afford. We can't keep uh, funding entitlements that we can't afford. Yeah. We can't give way to, um, to xenophobic immigration policies that undo one of the great strengths that we've always had, which is bringing the most ambitious people here from around the world. And we better fix our K-12 education system, which is the greatest threat to international, mm -hmm. to our national security. 
because um, our K-12 education system at this particular point in time, uh, if you agree uh, that the, what holds America together is it doesn't matter where you came from, it matters where you're going, you can come from humble circumstances, you can do great things. If I can look at your zip code and tell whether you're going to get a good education, then social cohesion yeah. is at risk. Yeah. The fact that, I, that only 30% of the people who take the basic skills test to get into the military can pass it. Yeah. The fact that uh, we are 15th in this international uh, ranking, 27th in that one, is a threat to, the international, to our national security. We will have unemployable people because the $18 an hour unskilled labor job is gone forever. Mm -hmm. And those people will live on the dole and we will become an aggrieved, entitled society. Mm -hmm. And then China has an open road. Right. But if we continue to build on our strengths and deal with our problems, we'll I don't be, think the Chinese can We will us. be fine, yeah. This is a... This is a sort of question about leadership style, and the question is how do you deal with criticisms of decisions you've made? And I think the corollary to it, if I can add to it, is it's also a question of how do you keep from getting physically exhausted yeah. during the course yeah. of the job? Yeah. Yes. Well, on, on the criticism side, um, I, I'll admit to engaging in what I would call the reverse Washington read. The Washington read is you look for your name and you only read those things that your name's in it. I basically, if my name was in it, I didn't read it. Because uh, in general, uh, if you're too attuned to kind of the daily criticism, then you're going to pay attention to that and the headlines and not to um, history's judgment, um, if you will. Now, to remind myself to pay attention to history's judgment, not today's headlines, I kept four portraits of secretaries of state near me. So it was just a little mental exercise. First was Thomas Jefferson. Okay, everybody kept Thomas Jefferson, founding father, first secretary of state. To my mind, slightly overrated founding father. Um, but, you know, I like Alexander Hamilton myself, but Thomas Jefferson. Secondly, I kept um, George Marshall, greatest secretary of state, uh, single-handedly saved two million starving Europeans. But I also kept um, uh, Dean Acheson. When Dean Acheson left power, all people remembered was who lost China. And now he's remembered as the founding father of NATO and the foundational institutions that led to victory in the Cold War. Yeah. And I kept William Seward. Now, why would anybody keep William Seward? Well, he bought Alaska. And if you think congressional hearings are rough now, you should have heard his. <laughs> How could you have paid the Tsar of Russia $7 million for that icebox? In mm -hmm. fact, it was called yeah. Seward's Icebox, Seward's Folly. And then a few years ago, I was with the defense minister of Russia, a man named Sergei Ivanov, and Sergei says to me, oh, Condi, I was just in Alaska. It is so beautiful. He said, it reminds me of Russia. <laughs> I said, Sergei, it used to be Russia. <laughs> We're really glad that Seward bought Alaska. Today's headlines, history, judgment, rally the same. So I reminded myself of that. Now, you have to be a little careful not to shut yourself off to criticism because sometimes it's warranted. Yeah. So you try to balance being constantly a slave to the headlines and never listening to people who might be right that you're doing something wrong. Mm -hmm. I, tell my, I tell my students all the time, you know, at least be open to the yeah. possibility that you might be wrong. Okay. So can you name a mistake you made? Uh, sure. Uh, <laughs> a bunch. No, but, <laughs> not nominating me. That's no, 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 that was not a mistake. <laughs> no, the, so, so this is that. And, and yes, I can name mistakes that I made, but you also have to get to the place that you don't constantly look back, you know, yeah. because people say to you all the time, well, what's plan B? Yeah. Well, plan B is to make plan A work. Yeah. So yeah. you keep Very working. Very good. <laughs> um, as to the matter of um, physical and sort of mental um, acuity and, and staying uh, alert and not being tired, I tried to be disciplined about a couple of things. Um, I exercised six days a week, no matter where I was in the world. And I told my, uh, my staff, you want me to exercise, right? Secondly, you want me to get enough sleep because you do not want me to make decisions on behalf of the United States on four hours sleep. 
Um, some people say, oh, I only need four hours sleep. Well, I'm not one of them. And so uh, I need to get enough sleep. And if that means that I'm going to tell my host, uh, this dinner has to end at 9.30 or I'm leaving, yeah. you have to do it. Have to. Now, if I had to negotiate all night, I had to do it. Yeah. But you know, some social dinner where you're stuck at somebody, some foreign minister's home and they haven't served dinner and it's 10 o'clock, just, I didn't do it. Yeah. And then finally, I tried to make time for myself and my routine was on Sundays to get up, make my phone calls around the world. I had, for instance, a standing phone call with the British Foreign mm -hmm. Secretary. Mm -hmm. And then I would go to church at National Presbyterian Church. I'm Presbyterian, church only lasted an hour. I was home at noon, 12.15, and I tried to take off until seven o'clock. Mm -hmm. I would go play the piano, I would go play golf, I would watch the NFL, and at seven o'clock, I would call back into the uh, operations center and get back on, in my mind, what was uh, gonna face us. Because I experienced after 9-11 what I was like when I worked 39 days in a row, 17, 18, 19 hours a day under enormous pressure and I wasn't any good to anybody by the mm -hmm. end of it. And so yeah. I think you really have to set some parameters, some limits, and stick to them. Okay. Now the next question. And also, you got to travel to Asia and <laughs> make sure that I didn't have to go too often. So. And negotiate on four hours <laughs> sleep. <laughs> exactly. Nuclear weapons, Nuclear too. weapons, too. Right. <laughs> All right. So uh, this is a little change of pace. So what was it like working with Alec Baldwin on 30 Rock? <laughs> Is he as difficult and temperamental as he seems, et cetera? Yeah. Well, 30 Rock was really a lot of fun. I had not wanted to do it, and I have to say that the, I have relatively young people working for me, and uh, Georgia Godfrey, my chief of staff, is here, and she was one of the people who insisted I really had to go ahead and do 30 Rock. And uh, it was a lot of fun. Um, and that one and a half minutes or so that I was on took half a day to shoot because we kept doing it over and over and over. Not because people couldn't remember their lines, but because Tina Fey is a creative genius and she makes it up as she's going along. All of a sudden you've wow. done it one way. She says, you know what would be really funny? It'd be really funny if Alex said this and you said that. And so it turned into uh, a really more interesting, I thought I was gonna go do my lines and leave. No, it yeah. was really kind of a creative, a creative deal, yeah. and Alec Baldwin was, was actually very nice, and we had a great time. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, what are your future plans? Academia, government, elective office. The NFL job is gone now. Yeah. So that's, NFL uh, job's gone. Although yeah. I, I've gotten to know Roger Goodell, and I told him, I said, you know, Roger, when I was struggling with the Iranians and the Russians every day, your job looked pretty good. But from Northern California, it doesn't look so good anymore. So, yeah. uh, um, I love being an academic. I love being at Stanford. Um, it's a place that I've been now since I was 25 years old. I went as an assistant professor. And um, as long as they'll have me, I'll be there. And since I'm tenured, that's as long as I'd like to be there. Okay. So um, it's, uh, it, being a university professor is great. I do some other things. I am uh, with Steve Hadley, the the former National Security mm -hmm. Advisor. We have a little strategic consulting firm. We have help American companies that are uh, trying to do business abroad in emerging markets. Um, I also work very closely with the Boys and Girls Clubs of America and on education reform issues because one of the problems we've got is we have the shortest learning day and the shortest learning year of any country in the industrialized world. Joel Klein will tell you that our learning day was set on the notion that kids had to get home in time to do the harvest. Yeah. The agrarian. Right? And they yeah, needed yeah. to be out in the summer to do the harvest. Yeah. And so since you're probably not going to suggest that they go to school another three hours a day, the question is could you do more with extended learning day through boys and girls clubs? I started with some friends in a place called East Palo Alto and mm -hmm. um, underprivileged area near Stanford, something called the Center for a New Generation. There are now five of them, and there's one in Atlanta. It's an enrichment, and, and, um, and, um, enrichment program uh, for 
after school and uh, summer. It's not for the talented tenth and it's not for remedial. It's for that mass of kids in the middle who might be uh, inclined to do more if learning were fun and interesting. Um, and then I also uh, play uh, benefit concerts, piano concerts for kids' music programs because um, I'm very saddened that we have cut the arts out of the schools. Mm -hmm. Really drives me crazy when people say the arts are extracurricular. I believe they are a critical part of uh, the education of the whole human being. Mm -hmm. And so uh, those are some of the activities that, I, that I'm engaged in and I really love my life. Okay. Because the next question is, would you, be, would you accept the vice presidential nomination I'm taking from your previous answer? No. No. Uh, <laughs> you know, it, it, part of it is that you have to know what you like and what you don't. I, I love policy. I do not love politics. And uh, I really learned this. I was on a campaign very early. I was on the George W. Bush campaign at the end of 98, before he had even declared. We started working together. And I can remember some of those early campaign events in sort of April, May of 99. And you'd go to five rallies in a day. Some of them would be kind of small. And at the end of the day, he was raring to go and I was raring to go to bed. And I knew from that moment that the people who run for office and do it successfully are of a different makeup. Yeah. And they somehow draw energy from the political process. I find it innervating. Hmm. So I'm happy to be engaged in policy. Uh, but I'm not really, politics is not for me. Yeah. Well, the next question is, do you have any advice for the current GOP candidates <laughs> on their foreign policy agenda? Uh, sure, why not? Uh, <laughs> the, the most important advice I can give anybody running for office, not the incumbent, because the incumbent mm -hmm. has different responsibilities, but um, be a little careful with the following answer. On day one, I will, because no, you won't. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, if, I mean, President Obama did this, right? On day one, I will issue the order to close Guantanamo in one year. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah right, you did, and yeah. look where we are. And, and so it's, it's candidates of both parties. You know, it's an overwhelming temptation to start laying out. So, so when you lay out an agenda, Lay it out in sort of big, broad, strategic strokes, mm -hmm. not in uh, you know, specific answers. I, I almost don't listen to what will you do about Iran, because you'll get in the Oval Office and you'll see the constraints and you'll, you won't be dealing with a blank slate, and so you'll have to make adjustments. Yeah. So what kinds of questions should you be uh, answering? What do you think the role of the United States is in the world? Uh, is the United States exceptional? Because, by the way, if the United States isn't exceptional, then why should the American people bear the burdens of international leadership that they have borne since 1945? Mm -hmm. Why should we? Why shouldn't we just be like, if we're just like any other country, why shouldn't we be like any other country and say, well, America, you handle it? Uh, why should we continue to maintain a defense budget that can defend us and the rest of the world when everybody else's defense budget is falling through the floor? Mm -hmm. Why should we, as we've done, uh, put our own short-term self-interest aside and sanction Iran and not allow American companies to deal with Iran for decades? Mm -hmm. Now the rest of the world's finally catching up. So if the United States of America isn't exceptional, and we don't have something special to say about how human history ought to unfold, then let us off the hook. And we'll just go back to building the United States internally. Mm -hmm. So that's the question that I would like the uh, candidate to, to grapple with. Mm -hmm. And then finally tell me, as I suggested in an earlier question, Tell me how you're going to deal with the deficit. Tell me how you're going to deal with entitlement. Tell me what you really think a reasonable defense budget looks like. Because ultimately, it's the strength of the United States at home that will determine whether or not we have the confidence to lead. Mm 
And so when uh, people say, oh, it's a terrible thing that foreign policy isn't being debated widely in the uh, campaign, well, yeah, I'm a foreign policy expert. I'd love mm -hmm. to see that. But I'm really much more interested in how you're going to solidify right. the basis for American power. Right. Well, we're already sort of in overtime here, but uh, just one more question. It's just it's in one related to your book. Uh, on page 706 <laughs> of your, your wonderful book, you wrote that our dean was sometimes petulant with Vice President <laughs> Cheney's office. He isn't petulant with any of us, so could it be that Vice President <laughs> Cheney's office was petulant with him? <laughs> Let me start by saying uh, petulant is a term of endearment. Oh. Right? So, uh, <laughs> Chris had one of the most difficult uh, jobs in the administration because he had one of the most controversial accounts, and that was how to deal with the hermit kingdom known as North Korea. And there were really two uh, camps within the administration about how to deal with North Korea. And over the period of eight years, really starting quite early in the administration, these two camps warred with one another about what US policy ought to be toward North Korea. Now just to briefly rehearse the facts, North Korea isolated brutal regime that the president uh, had called uh, the leader of it, Kim Jong-il, loathsome. Um, and he is, was, and, and his uh, successor is. And a regime that was dangerous because it was seeking and making considerable progress toward a nuclear weapon. Right? Um, this was a regime whose only real friend in the world was China. And even the Chinese couldn't really control what the North Koreans did. So the question is, how do you deal with this problem? Well, on one side was an argument, just squeeze them and squeeze them and squeeze them and squeeze them, sanction them, don't talk to them, uh, threaten them, and the regime will fall. Well, that had been basically the thought since about 1980. And the regime was still in power and still making progress toward a, a nuclear weapon. The other was, well, let's negotiate with them and see if we can come to uh, some kind of agreement with them. And that side was constantly frustrated by the fact that every time the North Koreans signed an agreement, pretty soon they would violate it. So you have these two warring camps within the administration. So when I became secretary, I said to President Bush, you know, I think we need to try something different here, which is, we're not going to solve the North Korean problem, all right? We're, we're not. The well, only thing that will ultimately solve the North Korean problem is when the North Korean regime falls from power, but we don't really have the capacity to make that happen. And by the way, it makes both the South Koreans nervous because they don't want North Koreans flooding into South Korea, and it makes the Chinese nervous because they don't want instability on the Korean Peninsula. So let's put together a strategy that tries to manage the problem with the Chinese, the Russians, the Japanese, the South Koreans, all who have a stake in how this turns out. And that will mean sometimes that we will have to give a little bit to get the North Koreans to a place that maybe they'll let inspectors in, for instance. It was Chris's job to carry out that policy. And not surprisingly, he wasn't too popular with the people who wanted to squeeze the North Koreans and bring them down and have regime change. But I think we, you know, I think we actually managed to turn the North Korean issue, which could have been a source of conflict with the Chinese and the South Koreans and the Russians and others, into at least a realm in which we tried to cooperate toward making some progress with the North Koreans. And that's where it sits today. And sometimes in international politics, you have no choice but to manage a problem. You're not going to solve it. You manage it until circumstances change. We managed the division of Germany for 40 years. And then the Soviet Union was about to collapse, and all of a sudden you could solve the German problem. And Germany unites completely on Western terms. Sometimes you have to manage a problem, and I think that's what we were trying to do. Okay.
Thank you very much. Look, uh, Madam Secretary, it's just been a wonderful, wonderful opportunity.